So tell me about what it was like in the beginning, so to speak. I mean, you come from Newfoundland, you go to Winnipeg, you're a painter, you are talking your way into productions. I mean, Winnipeg in the 50s is a different place and MTC is just being formed. Was it exciting? Was it depressing? Was it, what was oh, it like? So exciting. Yes, exciting, just as it would be anywhere, I suppose. Winnipeg had had uh, a very good uh, history of theater behind it. The John Holden Players, a very old company, played there many, many times, and they had this playhouse that was built, I think, on the Pantages idea of, of, of Hollywood or New York or something. And was that it, the Dominion Theater or the Pantages in Winnipeg? That was the, uh, well, that was in Pantages. The Dominion was where we started the Theater 77, uh, which after a year and a half or a year, be it became Manitoba Theater Center uh, when they moved into the new space. And why uh, was it called Theater 77? 77 steps from Portage and Maine. I have no idea. I thought John Hirsch was more brilliant than that, but anyway, but he named it, I believe. He and Tom Hendry were wonderful uh, go-getters, and the quality of life in Winnipeg uh, came, came to uh, be a, a, a decided asset. Uh, European, you know, uh, influence, and European love of theater, and so generally, I suppose, there's something of that nature going for it. Um, now it's less European, but it's really uh, taken off again because of time and because of, uh, of uh, choice of artistic directors and so on. But the Holden Players... Were they a, they were a touring group, is that right? They're a touring group, I believe. So they weren't, yes. There was very little that was permanent in Winnipeg. I think maybe a, a you know, a, 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 what do they call it? Well, music group anyway, you know, things of that nature. I was always impressed when I when But I everything came alive at that point, at that very much alive. When Hirsch, with the Manitoba Theatre Center, we had, don't forget, just the tail end of Essa Young for radio. That was happening. A bit of live was happening, live drama. Um, the Little Theatre was going. The Winnipeg Ballet was really starting to come up. Right. Things of that nature. The Philharmonic was built later on. So it was a city that it appeared as though it was. It might as well have been surrounded by water. They served themselves. They, they made sure they had lived well within, you know, as opposed to having to rely on the rest of rest of Canada, I guess. And what would uh, a first rehearsal at Theater 77 be like? Oh, gosh. Oh, it was quite wonderful. You know, some time ago, I was invited to go back to celebrate the 40th anniversary. And I sat there looking at the money makers, the, or at least the fund, f fundraising people and so on. And I don't want to sound too milky about it, but I, uh, well, I lost train of thought while I was listening to them because I couldn't help imagine. I imagined uh, behind them coming through the door for the first time, all of us as actors, to go on to a life of theater, leaving the daylight, going into the darkness of, of whatever was to come. Uh, great ideas, lovely things. Hirsch seemed so brilliant at that time could almost do anything that he wanted to, or, you know, that he put his hand to. For a new boy from Hungary, that became uh, quite special for us. Uh, American, American classics, English classics, uh, and all kinds of modern stuff, you know. But it's interesting that it took a boy from Hungary to create a theater in Winnipeg with Tom Hendry. Mm -hmm. But still, a driving force was not a Winnipegian, Winnipegodian, it was... A, a young man who'd come from Hungary. That's true. And he was, he just never stopped. He was a lesson for everybody, really. While they were finding themselves, uh, he had simply relied on uh, just his, his brain, I suppose. I don't know. He seemed to have this innate sense of what was right, what could be done. And he always looked like a flamingo going to or coming from an idea. 
you know, always something going on, always. And uh, it's quite a person, old John. And uh, they have a statue of him there now. And That's right. He John and Tom. Yeah. yeah. No, I could listen to him talk about theater to Wasn't he remarkable? drive it. Uh, on the other hand, the production, one production in my life in which I knew I was bad, I was going to be bad, I would be bad for the rest of the run, was in fact directed by John. <laughs> and <laughs> that was a painful. Yeah. So he had both this uh, brilliant, effervescent uh, intelligence that he created the thing, and then he had a darker side that oh, he did. some of us were. Oh, um, he did. Uh, rolled under. So he got to, uh, got to a stage where, and that was surprising to me. I hadn't seen him for some years, and, uh, and um, he was very tough on, very tough on people. I, and I mentioned it to him on one occasion. And what did he I say? I said, John, you're, I hear you're being a bit mean to the actors. <laughs> John said, well, I'm not running a, an old folks home, you know. Yeah. You know, he just, he right out. I think that he was, uh, I think at the basis of it, there was, there was, there had to be a reason that was only for John to know and not for us, you know. But. Uh, well, I think it's, he loved the theater. He wanted it better, and he thought the way to make it better was to yeah. prod people up, so to speak. And, uh, uh, but I said I, I, I've never agreed with that. The, the teacher director uh, idea was. No, I found that I found that difficult. He taught me, though, the when I saw him advocating for theater in a speech, like at the Kiwanis Club or this club, yeah. he, it was the first time I, I saw what it was to be a passionate, articulate advocate for the arts and for theater, and how to walk into fundraising situations or you know kinsman club situations and actually advocate. And he did that, and I watched him do it, and it's it struck. It buried something. Chrome was on 11, and this was Chrome was on 13. I thought, yes, okay, that's, you have to have that kind of articulateness and advocate for the uh, arts, otherwise we won't be around. And I learned that from that's him. That's right. That's right. And you swear that he simply studied up the night before. He just had these things. He called me in L.A. one year, seven, 1974, and said, Gordon, would you come up and play Sky Masterson in Guys and Dolls? And I said, <coughs> that sounds good. And uh, I knew, I knew uh, not to drop a name, I knew Brando, Marlon Brando, and I, 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 he said, uh, now where are you going? I said, I'm going to Winnipeg. Winnipeg? What for? I said, I'm going to play Sky Masterson in Guys and Dolls, your old part. He had just finished doing the, he had done the musical. You're going to Winnipeg? The play in a twenty-year-old musical. Uh, you know, he just, so, I said, so I said, "Yeah, that's where I'm going." So off I went. I had a great time. John's opening gambit, opening thing, of uh, Guys and Dolls, with all the actors present for the first time, was remarkable. Never heard anything like it. It seemed so. Unlike John, to speak of Damon Runyon as though he, he was a brother. I mean, it was just quite extraordinary. And when he took over CBC television, that was important for me. And this was in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. John Hirsch took over CBC television. That's and right. it came to, it came to it, I want to say reinvigorated it, because it was vigorous, but it it brought a, a contemporaneous, and he started the For the Record series and a number of series that That's were right. very important very for Very much. And that was Hirsch being his, you know, intelligent, difficult self, pushing that department even further, which was That's right, exactly. He was the one who gave me a title for Gift to Last. When he, when he asked me, he said, Gordon, write a, write a, uh, <coughs> write a show about, a, a, let's say, a Southern Ontario family at Christmas time. So I wrote Give to Last, the, the first show, and uh, I said, I need a title, John. I keep thinking of a, 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 a lasting gift or something. John said, a gift to last. <laughs> so, you know, that's what that title was. But he was also sharp enough to know that uh, things such as, Gordon, look at this. 
the newspaper every day, the headlines, or something down the page. There's your story. Write that, you know. And he he brought, he could he could be simple. I mean, you would like that, and you could say, well. Yeah, but I got to do the writing, so it's a tough thing to do. In the meantime, uh, but he would make it simple going in and say, "Relax, you know, just just do it." And these these things that appear in front of us every day. So, a gift uh, to last uh, wasn't approached as a series. It started as a one-off, as a Christmas show, yeah. And yeah. then someone uh, said, "Oh, that's nice, Gordon. Now write me thirteen of them or whatever." It would have been John, yeah, right. who said, "Let's." Bring it back. And how many seasons did it run for? I don't know if I say about two and a half or something, or two, three. Uh, there were 22 scripts. I wrote 21 of them. And 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 uh, I had those at home. I was going to bring those today. It was like that. In the meantime, we're into different times, as you know. So I've now got them all, all on one cassette. I mean, it's so crazy, isn't it? What? Anyway, and you hired me on a gift to last, and I—that was the first time I, I know you were. I was going to say that. So God, what kind right. of time does that take from your life to write twenty-one of those scripts and act in it at the same time? Uh, well, I had different energies then, so I suppose it was not as dreadful, not as dire as it sounds. Um, they gave me an office down there, so I'm now in the office and I'm sketching out first drafts of everything. Herb Rowland came in, who was the producer at this point, and he opened the door and says, Gordy, could we have the second draft of the first first one? Of, you know, a second, uh, um, yeah, second draft of the, of the first play. No, I'm going to write all the first drafts. So I, I would do six first drafts of everything. Wow. And then fill them in, you know, and so thing. So you write quickly. So that yeah, very quickly, yeah. Yeah, there used to be a uh, an actor from France. His name was Christian Marcand. He came to visit Brando and, and other people down in L.A. He came up to the door once and he said, "Gordon, I hear you write fast." This is in L.A. And I said, "Well, yeah, maybe I do." And he said, "I have an idea, Anthony Nautard." He said says in France, the peak of the plague is like the peak of art. It's the same thing. You either purify or you perfect or whatever. It comes from that peak or going to that zone, as we call it now. You know, so the peak of the plague or the peak the of peak the plague? The peak of plague. Of the plague. Of a plague, yes. And after you either die or you purify you know, you and you perfect yourself. And he said somewhere in there, he compared it to the art, to the peak of art. That lovely idea you get when you're writing something and you're saying, yes, and nobody's looking over your shoulder, it's yours, you know. Okay. Same thing with acting, that peak that you get at a certain time, allowing you to fail two minutes later at some other moment, but not enough to spoil the overall effect. And it's something about that and that particular zone is a lovely one to write in, lovely one to act in, and I suppose it has to do with pulling it from yourself, you know. But anyway, Christian Marquand said, I have this, I want to do this thing about the plague, he said, but give it a Western motif, could you do that? So I wrote this thing called When the Sky Falls. And it was quite different, I thought. And we got it to a few people, we got it to Burt Lancaster's company, he loved the first ten pages. <laughs> he didn't. He, he, that stopped his understanding of it. The rest of it didn't work for him at all because we really went on a very strange, strange style after that. Very, very different. So nothing ever happened to it, and I threw it away.